Channel 11. This is the News at 10. Good evening, everyone. I'm Valerie Coleman, sitting in for Kaidi Tong. We begin tonight with an alarming medical development. New York could well have its first rabies death in almost 40 years. Westchester County health officials say the findings of an autopsy of a little girl who died last month appear to be consistent with rabies, and she may have picked it up from a stray cat. Laurel Fairworth is standing by live at the Westchester County Medical Center with the latest. Laurel? Well, Valerie, tonight here in Westchester County, there is fear, fear of rabies. And so to play it safe, between 25 and 50 people who had contact with the little girl are being tested. Compassion for a sick animal appears to have killed a young girl. That and the fact that the pet had rabies. Westchester County officials say the girl caught the disease after comforting a cat that had been in a fight, trading saliva or blood with the animal, and then rubbing her hands in her mouth or her eyes. A month later, the youngster had an accident and was taken to a local hospital and then transferred here to Westchester Medical, where it was discovered she had viral encephalitis. But by then, she had the symptoms. It was too late, and she died two days later. Rabies is 100% curable, but once the symptoms show, which I assume would be a month or so down the road, nothing works. You are just dead. There are only three people in medical history that have ever survived having rabies. And officials tell us the disease is not only a threat in the suburbs, but in the city as well. They say it's just as easy to find a rabid animal in Central Park as it is in Westchester County. But many people like Grandma Leah are worried, worried about how to keep their children away from rabid animals and the possibility of an epidemic. What makes it so bad is that children are naturally drawn to animals and they're not careful and unless the grown-up says don't touch the animal unless you know that it's friendly or you have permission to touch it but it's hard you can't really and truly keep your eye on them all the time i think that's very sad since march 1992 there have been 75 confirmed cases of rabies in animals the most recent last week in queens officials say the best method of prevention immunize your household pets do not keep wild animals in your home. Stay away from sick, injured, and stray animals, and report all bites to the health department. Andrew Muller said the first thing he did when Magic was a puppy was get him his shots. Shame, shame that happened. It's easy, easy thing to, you know, to prevent. Yeah, easy thing to prevent. Yeah. Now to repeat, Pete, rabies can be cured if you catch it in time. The window is about a month. There are a series of shots you can get which aren't painful, but they are expensive. We're live in Westchester County. I'm Laurel Fairworth. Back to you, Jack and Valerie. Laurel, thank you very much. In Washington tonight, the House of Representatives is getting ready to vote on President Clinton's economic plan. Victory is still not insured. The president lobbied for votes throughout the day, and tonight he says he feels optimistic that it will, in fact, pass the House. John Abishan standing by live on Capitol Hill with a late report for us. John, how's it going? Jack and Valerie, in, in fact, the House started voting exactly four and a half minutes ago. Both the President and Speaker Tom Foley predict they'll win this one. If they're right, then, of course, it's up to the Senate, where we'll look for another vote about 24 hours from now, again with the White House counting on a razor-thin margin of victory. Don't pass the buck, pass the plan. <laughs> But first, they waded through hours of arguments, exaggeration, threats, and misstatements, deliberate or otherwise. And at times, you'd swear they were looking at different bills altogether. Putting taxes first, how we will shortchange America by Governor Bill Clinton and Senator Al Gore. 60,000 families in my district, and I think 58,000 in your district, will actually see their taxes go down. Or how about these, and which ones need glasses? It's the spending, stupid. The president claims his plan cuts spending. We say it does not. We anguished over the hours trying to reduce, and anyone that will say this does not reduce, it's not speaking the truth. The Democrats don't think it's a big deal to hurt over a million small businesses. Over 90% of small businesses will benefit from this tax plan. Phone calls jammed capital switchboards from both sides, and an Indiana grocer expressed this butcher paper petition signed by 5,000 customers opposed to the plan. Visual aids were aimed at the home TV audience. This is a dumbbell. I introduce you to Jurassic Pork. And there was anger. It is easy for politicians to scare the hell out of people who don't have the full facts. And you ought to be ashamed of yourselves. 
understand. One Democrat called the bill the opportunity of a lifetime. A Republican called it a train wreck uh, waiting speak, to happen. I yield myself a Democrat said side it will create jobs. A Republican economy. said... It's a job-killing bill. And all that debate, Jack and Valerie, probably did not change a single vote. No Republicans intended to vote for the Clinton compromise measure. And they needed 218 Democrats to pass it. We're uh, at under eight minutes now left to, in the vote in the House chamber. And we're waiting for that final tally. All right. Thank you, John. In Topeka, Kansas, a deadly standoff today. A gunman opened fire in a federal building. Office workers scattered in panic. The gunman was identified as Jack Gray McKnight. He began shooting outside a courtroom at about the same time that a car bomb exploded in the parking lot outside. One security guard died. Four people were injured in that standoff. It all ended when a bomb strapped to McKnight's body exploded, killing him. McKnight was at the courthouse today to be sentenced on drugs and weapons charges. Valerie? The danger is over in a Times Square high-rise fire, but there were tense moments for hundreds of office workers, many of whom thought that the real fire was simply a drill and were unknowingly trapped in the smoking blaze. Jason Carroll has the story. The fire was so intense at one point it melted and then blew out the windows on the 27th floor of the Bertelsmann office building. Smoke poured from the lobby and onto the street as firefighters ordered the evacuation of hundreds of people temporarily trapped inside the 40-story structure. Firefighters taking a little more than an hour to control the blaze. During those minutes, four people are overcome by smoke. One is taken to the hospital. Perhaps one of the most compelling aspects to the story is the fact that many of the people inside the office building ignored the fire alarms because they thought it was a fire drill that was scheduled for today. People were just very incredulous that it was actually a fire. And there's been many, many fire drills in the building. Bells have gone off a million times in testing the system and never really thought that this was actually a fire. And I just heard people screaming, they called it a fire. Well, I didn't believe it was, if it was true or, or, you know, it was false. Over and over, the people we interviewed shared similar stories of not taking the alarm seriously, most saying they knew it was real after heading down the stairwells. I kind of thought that it was still like the fire drill. As we were walking down the steps, I realized that, you know, it was real. Um, I heard sirens and smelled some smoke as we got to the lower floors. Not until you got around, well, actually down in the lobby did you actually see the smoke and really, it really hits you right here in the lobby. The blaze started inside a storage area on the high-rise's 27th floor. Most of the damage is limited to that area. An electrical short may be to blame. Now an investigation is underway as to why the sprinkler system in the new building didn't extinguish the flames as well as it should have. In the meantime, the next time the building's fire alarms start ringing, office workers don't plan on taking any chances. They'll evacuate, no questions asked. Jason Carroll, Channel 11, News at 10. A Bronx father's under arrest tonight after lying to police officers when he reported his nine-year-old daughter missing. Police say the father yesterday reported Leslie Marroquin Rodriguez missing after walking to a bodega in University Heights. As it turns out, according to police, the little girl was never missing. She's in fact on Long Island with her mother who called police when she heard of the search for her child. Police say the father has no custodial rights to the child and so far no motive has been reported for this hoax. We hope to have more on the story a bit later in the broadcast for you. Police are adding a possible fifth victim to their investigation of what may be a serial killer stalking gay men in Manhattan. The killings have now spread to three different states and are chilling in their similarities. Here's Barry Cunningham. Analyzing the grisly evidence of dismembered body parts dumped in Rockland County on Saturday, the county medical examiner says there are telltale signs of a latter-day Jack the Ripper no, who dissects his victims case. with surgical skill. The arms were amputated just below the shoulders by cutting through the, through the tissue, the skin, and when they got to the bone, they used a saw and sawed it through exactly at the same spot, just below where the ball goes in the joint. A Rockland County hot dog vendor discovered the severed head and arms wrapped in plastic and dumped in a trash can. The victim, Michael Sakara, a Manhattan typesetter, was openly homosexual, last seen alive in a Greenwich Village gay bar. The Rockland County prosecutor suspects that a serial killer who stalks gay men may have committed four similar murders in New York, New Jersey, and Pennsylvania. All four people left gay bars in the city of New York, were murdered, dismembered, placed in plastic bags, 
found it along roadsides of major highways in garbage cans. District Attorney Kenneth Gribbett says there are grotesque similarities, plus evidence of mutilated sex organs in the bloody killing of Peter Stickney Anderson, a prominent Philadelphia banker whose dismembered body was found in a trash barrel off the Pennsylvania Turnpike two years ago. Anderson was last seen at the townhouse, an Upper East Side gay bar, as was a third victim, Thomas Mulcahy, a Boston sales executive whose nude, headless torso was found in a New Jersey dumpster last summer. The mutilated corpses of two other gay men, Guillermo Mendez of Schenectady and Anthony Marrero, a male hustler who picked up men at the Port Authority, may also be related. Rockland County authorities have taken the lead in this investigation because Sakara's body parts were discovered here. But gay activists in Manhattan say city detectives are not being aggressive enough in investigating hate crimes against homosexuals, saying it was only after four gay men were literally hacked apart limb by limb that city police became active in the probe. In Rockland County, Barry Cunningham, Channel 11, News at 10. That 15-foot pilot whale nicknamed Willie is clinging to life tonight at the New York Aquarium in Coney Island. That whale was saved from possible injury in Long Island Sound last night, but the rescue itself could prove fatal. Deborah Quintana picks up the story. In the aquarium tank, the young whale, estimated to be only four years old, appears healthy, swimming briskly about. But looks are deceiving. Veterinarians say she's very sick. Whales that are sick enough to strand rarely survive. It was a dramatic midnight rescue. Marine mammal specialists so delicately hoisted the 1,000-pound pilot whale. She was first spotted stranded in the shallow waters off Orchard Beach. Despite several attempts to lure her back to deeper waters, the 11-and-a-half-foot whale, disoriented and tired, continued to return. The sick whale was captured and towed to the waters off Kings Point Merchant Marine Academy. They gently harnessed and lifted her. They poured ice on her to keep her cool as they whisked her away to the New York Aquarium in Coney Island. They valiantly tried to nurse her to health, but the odds are against them. No other whale retrieved in this area has survived. Whales and dolphins cannot afford to show signs of being sick out in the ocean. It means that they can't catch food, which means they only get weaker and go into a, a, a syndrome which uh, eventually ends in death. While they try to determine specifically what is making this whale sick, the veterinarians here say many times the whales strand themselves after eating garbage that's been dumped into the ocean, specifically plastics. Keeping a steady watch, this weary trainer has been with the whale since he helped lift her out of the sea. He keeps track of her every breath. The normal respiration for a whale of this kind is about one to two a minute and that's exactly what she's doing at this moment. The currents of the pool are constantly varied. As she glides through the water, you can barely catch a glimpse of the skin lesions she suffers. She won't eat. All they can do now is treat the whale with antibiotics and hope for the best. If the whale survives, aquarium staffers say she'll be returned to the sea. Deborah Quintana, Channel 11, News at 10. Straight ahead on the News at 10 as we continue some uncomfortable moments on the witness stand today for the wife in the Long Island surrogate custody battle. And we'll show you what happened when officials tried to remove dozens of cats from a filthy Manhattan apartment. We have an exclusive report tonight about an apartment building that was apparently built on very shaky ground and the city knew it the whole time. Plus, it was a match made in Congress. Staten Island Susan Molinari is heading for the altar with a fellow House member. We'll tell you about the unusual way he issued the proposal today. In the chair, I thought. Who's got the Yankees lighting up the boards? Who's got the hot bats bringing home the scores? Mattingly and Bob, Tartar Bull and more. Who plays? Yankees battle the twins tomorrow at 8. More German cities. More German cities non-stop. With four There are lots of things that come with a backyard barbecue. Here's what comes with Bennigan's Backyard Barbecue. A free order of our new tumbleweed twister onions with two barbecue meals. Thick juicy steaks. Tangy ribs or our famous chicken and ribs barbecue platter. So head to Bennigan's Backyard Barbecue for free tumbleweed twisters until Labor Day. Or stay home and see what comes with your barbecue. Bennigan's, the original recipe for fun. At MCI, whether you speak Cantonese, Ronnie Chen, I'm with MCI International. Japanese. Hi, my name is Michiko Munioka. A former ice skating coach is facing 12 years in prison.
for having sex with three of his young students. 37-year-old Stephen Savino of Westchester pleaded guilty to rape, sodomy, bail jumping, and endangering the welfare of a child. Savino confessed to having sex with three female students between the ages of 11 and 17. 55 other counts were dropped because the victims didn't want to testify. Sentencing set for October. The emotional battle over a baby born to a surrogate mother continues in a Long Island courthouse. Today, 50-year-old Jean Kaplan testified she knew her husband was having sex with Susan Chamberlain and promised the surrogate mother $25,000 in return for a baby. Drew Scott has the story. There were more emotional fireworks, tears, embarrassing admissions, and angry accusations during day two of the now sensational surrogate baby Shane trial in Suffolk County. Take your time. At the center of the dispute is two-month-old Shane Kaplan. Joe and Jeannie Kaplan say Susan Chamberlain backed out of a surrogate mother agreement after giving birth to the healthy child on May 29th, changing her mind and keeping the baby. Embarrassing, too, was testimony from Joe Kaplan's wife that Joe's efforts to naturally inseminate the surrogate mother were sometimes less than successful at tawdry motel trysts. She said Joe found it difficult to get sufficiently aroused. The only... Uh thing I did, I went a long visit because I understood at the time that it would be the only way I would be able to have a child. We are the ones that wanted him to begin with, okay? He was thought about in our hearts and our minds. Okay, any other reason? And I know we can provide a very loving home for him. Yesterday, Susan Chamberlain's own mother testified her daughter was a neglectful mother, drank too much, and was promiscuous. But the child's natural mother says this testimony and the statements that she never kissed or showed love to the surrogate baby is a lie. She says she is a fit parent, even though she's divorced without a job and has three other children. Oh, I love that baby. <laughs> um, my question to her is why did it take four weeks to go visit the baby that she wanted after the birth of him? That's my only comment. The surrogate baby Shane, as Susan calls him, remains at her home with relatives in Bath, Pennsylvania. This trial is expected to wrap up next week, at which time family court judge David Freundlich has the authority to order the child to remain there with his natural mother or for the baby to be returned to Long Island to the Kaplans. From Long Island, Drew Scott, Channel 11, News of 10. An animal rescue late last night took ASPCA workers on a horrid call. They had to remove about a hundred cats who were living inside a two-room apartment stuffed with garbage and infested with maggots. ASPCA workers went in after getting a report the cats were sick. When they got to the apartment, owner Terry Barraz allowed them in, but there was so much clutter the door would barely open. They had to go in through a fire escape and wear oxygen masks because of the smell. A nearby firehouse provided a cherry picker for the evacuation. Workers were only able to remove 35 cats. The ASPCA says all of them had to be put to sleep. Workers will go back for the rest after the city cleans out the apartment. A dozen families tonight might owe their very lives to an alarming discovery. Officials say their Upper West Side apartment building is near collapsing. But in this exclusive report, Glenn Thompson tells us the city may have aided in making this a potentially deadly disaster. 350 West 110th Street is a nightmare waiting to happen. A building so close to the verge of collapse that today all of the occupants were evacuated. As you can see, the uh, uh, collapse potential uh, in the bowing of this wall uh, and the cracks, uh, you know, forced us to evacuate the building. It's still in danger of collapsing. They have the risk of having their roofs and the whole building collapse right in front of them. You tell me, how could people feel like that? How could people feel when they continue paying rent to slumlords? The apartment building was constructed over over an underground stream which has gradually caused the structure to collapse on itself coupled with the water main break discovered today the building is teetering on the edge of disaster channel 11 news has obtained shocking proof that the city knew about the danger of this building collapsing back in november of last year an inspection done by manhattan's own chief engineer finding hazardous conditions warning the potential exists for a collapse at any time this is an unsafe condition and yet nothing was done by either the building's owner or the city. Are you aware of that inspection being done, though? I'm aware of it. And how come nothing was done in the building? No comment. 
Well, documents prove this building was found to be unsafe almost 10 months ago. Residents say they were told nothing about the imminent danger of collapse. 1992? Yeah, stating that uh, the building is unsafe. the building unsafe. And nobody told you anything or did anything? Well, we no, said no, this. No. no, we didn't know anything about you this. You didn't know you were living in an unsafe building even though the city had already determined it was unsafe? No. no. According to them, this building was in, in good condition. No, the structure was fine with them and all that. For now, the building will remain vacated as the city considers condemning the structure as it has the building next door. The dozens of displaced families will be housed by the Red Cross in the city. Despite losing their homes, most tonight are just thankful to be alive. In Upper Manhattan, I'm Glenn Thompson, Channel 11, News at 10. We're going back to Washington now. The House has just finished voting on President Clinton's economic package, and John Obershawn is standing by with the results. Very close, John. Oh, Jack, it could not have been closer. President Clinton won this one by the skin of his teeth. 218 votes for this compromise deficit reduction plan, 216 votes against. He needed 218, a majority of the 435 House members. That's playing it pretty tight, and he lobbied hard today. He was on the phone most of the day, both with wavering House members and Senate members, whose votes he'll be counting on tomorrow. All right, thank you, John. John Orbison, a very close vote, 218 to 216. President Clinton's economic package passes the House. The Senate votes tomorrow. And when the News at 10 continues, a day after the sentencing of two Los Angeles police officers, Rodney King speaks out on the punishment given to the men who beat him. A New York late night institution's moving on. Joe Franklin is retiring from the longest running talk show on television. We'll have a report. And Jerry Girard is here with a preview of the sports. Forum. Yes, more than 50,000 fans at Yankee Stadium today. Thank goodness there was a game schedule. It worked out perfectly. And the Yankees get even in the series with the Jays. We'll have all the highlights. Carter's back. It's gone. It's time. It speeds through space, locks onto its target, destroying the enemy with a thunderous. Jets football is booming on Channel 11 as the Jets unleash their new top gun, star quarterback Boomer Esiason. Check out a power pack roster with Ronnie Lock, Leonard Marshall, and Johnny Johnson. It's going to be a real dogfight when Boomer bombs the Pittsburgh Steelers with color commentary by Joe Namath. Live Saturday at 6 on Channel 11. Some credit cards charge fat interest rates, but not Discover Card. With Smart Rate, the more you use your Discover Card for purchases, the lower your interest rate can be. Now as low as 14.9%. It pays to Discover. It's not normal to take a luxury car engine and suspension and make it a van. But that's how we build the Mazda MPV. Because we just thought a van that began as a car might appeal to you. It wasn't normal to make a luxury car so different looking. But that's how we build the Mazda 929. Because we just thought having something exceptional might appeal to you. At the Bronx Zoo Wildlife Park, where imaginations run wild. A six-year-old girl is clinging to life tonight after being mowed down on her bicycle by a stolen livery cab. 19-year-old Michael Brown is charged with robbery, assault, and drunk driving in last night's crash in Bed-Stuy, Brooklyn. Police say Brown was a passenger in a cab when he suddenly leaped into the front seat, kicked the driver out, and sped away. Brown was allegedly behind the wheel when the cab ran down one woman, jumped the curb, crashed into several cars, pinning the little girl and her bike between a parked van and a metal fence. She's now critical. The other victim suffered leg and back injuries, and witnesses held Brown at bay until police arrived. No one knew her. She wasn't here long enough. Her mother allegedly killed her right after giving her life. But a group of strangers opened their hearts and their wallets to make sure this baby would be buried with dignity. New Jersey correspondent Veronica Mitchell reports. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I feel no evil. Prosecutors say the murdered newborn did not live long enough to even get a name. But thanks to the kindness of strangers, baby girl Castilla will at least get a proper burial. Give her eternal rest, O Lord, and may your light shine upon her forever. A group of Union City police officers fought in court for the right to bury the baby that has been lying unclaimed in the Bergen County morgue for over eight months. 
A judge granted their request in late July. The infant was uh, only in his world a short time and a tragic ending and to leave it lay and on a slab in the medical examiner's office, none of us could do that. Police say the baby's mother strangled her to death in her Union City home shortly after giving birth in November and then threw the little girl's body in the trash on the curb. Police eventually found the infant's corpse in a North Arlington garbage dump after digging through 80 tons of trash. Once we recovered it, we were, you know, your mouth just drops and your heart stops for a minute and you gasp for breath because it's a sad situation here and a terrifying uh, way to die. Will you ever forget that uh, day when you found the baby in that dump pile? Forget, no. It's something that's in my heart forever. A Jersey City Monument Company is making a tombstone that reads Baby Girl Castillo. The Lieber Funeral Home is donating the funeral, a plot at Holy Cross Cemetery, and the infant's tiny white coffin that measures only two feet long. My wife and I are trying to have children at this point, and, uh, and the difficulty that we're having uh, trying to have children uh, certainly spurs me on. Maria Costilla, the baby's mother, is scheduled to go on trial in September. If convicted of murdering her baby, she faces life in prison. But that's in the fall. For now, at least, the thoughts of everyone here are on a small coffin and the newborn that lies inside. The baby girl whose life ended before ever beginning. In Union City, Veronica Mitchell, Channel 11 News at 10. It is calm on the streets of Los Angeles tonight. Police have ended a 24-hour state of alert. That alert came after the sentencing of two police officers convicted of violating Rodney King's civil rights. Tonight, King said he's happy the officers are going to jail, but he doesn't think they'll be there long enough. No, I'm not satisfied with the sentence. There's no way I could be satisfied with the sentence. If it had been me, I would have been doing almost 10, 15 years. So there's no way that I'm going to be satisfied with the sentence, but again, once you're going up against police officers, it's hard to, it's hard to prove it. Who's going to believe you? Both officers were sentenced to two and a half years in prison, even though federal sentencing guidelines called for six to seven year sentences. Prosecutors say they may appeal the sentences. The Postal Service is tightening up on hiring practices in an effort to reduce violence in post offices. Postal workers have killed or wounded supervisors and other employees ten times since 1983. And Postmaster General Marvin Runyon says it's time to take a more careful look at potential employees and do it as they're on the way in. We've conducted updating training in all of our personnel offices to assure that our people understand how to properly screen applicant information and correctly interpret it. We've also created standard operating procedures and management checklists to assure compliance with appropriate hiring procedures. We're about to competitively award a nationwide contract to an outside firm which will gather required criminal records, employment history, and where appropriate, driving records of applicants. Runyon also defended the post office, saying private industries have higher incidents of violence. Jack? Those five government employees fired in the so-called Travelgate scandal have finally been cleared. They were originally accused of financial mismanagement, but the White House admitted it was wrong in those accusations. The five workers are no longer being investigated by the Justice Department. They're also free to get new government jobs, although they probably will not be returned to the travel office. A rare victory today in the battle against the relentless flooding in the Midwest. Flood waters are now receding around the historic town of Prairie du Rocher, Illinois. Earlier this week, the Army Corps of Engineers tore down two levees, one above the town and one below, trying to relieve stress on the barriers protecting the town, and so far, it's worked. Water is also receding in most flood zones north of St. Louis. A lot more news straight ahead tonight. Dramatic testimony at the Kimberly Mays trial. The teenager describes the day that she found out she was switched at birth. And how much would you be willing to pay to have Carly Simon come and perform a concert in your living room? <laughs> well, she's auctioned off her services and will tell you the price. How much would you pay her to go to the neighbor's house? Here's Linda Church <laughs> with a preview of the weather. Depends on your neighbors, I guess. Uh, as far as we're concerned, what a great day. Temperatures finally cooled off here. We dried up. There is some good news for us. We also have some scattered showers and thunderstorms heading our way. However, look what happened again today. Missouri, Iowa hit by heavy rains and strong thunderstorms. As much as four inches of rain for them. Our weather later in the news. Channel 11, WPIX New York, our Tribune Broadcasting Station.
a hero unlike any other. Got a beer? Move over, Casanova. Back off, Rambo. Ah, book, ducko. From Chuck Norris to Chuck Berry, this rock and roll animal is here to play. George Lucas presents Back to the Future's Leah Thompson in the outrageous adventures of Howard the Duck. Sunday at 5 on Channel 11, New York's movie station. Hot prices, hot selection. Tickets for a contribution of only $40 and four tickets for just $75. All proceeds go to Channel 11's Care for Kids Fund, dedicated to organizations that help kids in our community. Call now. Recapping our top stories tonight, Westchester County health officials say New York State may have its first case of a human death from rabies in almost 40 years. Officials say the autopsy findings of a little girl who died last month appear to be consistent with rabies. The child, whose identity has not been released, may have picked up the disease from a stray cat. A fire in Times Square high-rise today trapped several dozen people on the building's top floors. It was a brief fire, but it blew out windows on those upper floors. There were some injuries, although hundreds of people were evacuated safely, including a woman who was pregnant. And President Clinton's economic plan, $496 billion worth, barely got through the House tonight. The vote was as close as it could be, 218 to 216. It needed 218 votes to pass. The Senate votes on the bill tomorrow. Victory there, still uncertain tonight. Valerie? There was more dramatic testimony from a 14-year-old girl who was switched at birth and now wants to cut ties with her biological parents. Kimberly Mays learned the shocking truth after the girl she was switched with died at the age of nine. Pat Etheridge has more. Kimberly Mays took the stand and recalled the day when as a nine-and-a-half-year-old girl, her father told her the story of two babies switched at birth. My dad sat me down um, outside on the porch and he talked about this little girl and um, he said that these people were saying that I was their biological daughter and I started crying and I said, Daddy, don't take them, don't let them take me away. And still brings tears to my eyes. Psychologist Deborah Day delivered powerful testimony supporting Kimberly's bid to sever all ties with her biological family. Did you confront her with the question of what would happen if she were ordered by the court to meet with or to have any kind of relationship with the twigs? Yes, sir, I did. What were those findings? Uh, her response to me was twofold, that number one, she would run away, she would not go, or number two, she would chain herself to some object in order not to be uh, forced to go. Well, I'll tell you what, Kimberly's attorneys are trying to establish that Regina Twig is emotionally unstable, while attorneys for the Twigs contend a 14-year-old is not mature enough to make an adult decision she may later regret. Bob Mays has raised Kimberly since she was switched at birth with another baby. His wife died when Kimberly was two. The other little girl went home with the twigs and later died of a heart defect. Despite the blood ties, Kimberly made it clear in court she wants no relationship with the couple that conceived her. Do you understand that as a result of this process, you would cut off any legal rights you may have to inherit any assets or money from the twigs? That's correct. Does that cause you any concern at all? No. Money can't buy love. Pat Etheridge, Sarasota, Florida. Hezbollah guerrillas launch attacks against Israel and its allies inside the Israeli-occupied security zone of southern Lebanon. The attacks wounded two Lebanese soldiers. Meantime, Secretary of State Warren Christopher reports progress today in his ongoing shuttle diplomacy. After meetings in Jerusalem with Israeli Prime Minister Rabin, Christopher brought the latest message of peace to Jordan. Tomorrow he has another round of talks set with the Syrian leader Hafez Assad. The United Nations is facing a battle of its own tonight. Secretary Secretary General Boutros Boutros Ghali is appealing to the leaders of the 180 member countries to pay up about $2 billion in debts. The biggest debtor is the United States, which owes about $830 million. The next biggest are Russia, which owes $510 million, and Japan, that owes almost $100 million. Boutros Ghali says the UN only has enough cash to last about a month. On Wall Street, the stock market slipped a little today. The Dow Jones Industrials dropped a little more than three points. Decliners uh, led gainers 10 to 9. Trading came in at 250 million shares. Well, 
It seems as though the first family may be expanding, but not in the traditional way that you might think of. A 52-year-old woman in Tucson, Arizona, says she is President Clinton's half-sister. The Arizona Republic newspaper reports Sharon Pettyjohn's birth certificate lists her father as William Jefferson Blythe. That is the same name as President Clinton's father. Blythe died shortly before Mr. Clinton was born. Asked about all of this today, White House spokeswoman Dee Dee Meyer said no comment. In June, a California man claimed he's President Clinton's half-brother and shares the same father. And when the news at 10 continues, death claims a popular daytime television star. We'll tell you the story of some rappers who are mad at Michael Jackson, and it all has to do with the Beatles. What should I say? Love bleach. Well, listen, that's my gold teeth. Listen, my man's up. Who's got the Yankees lighting up the board? This just in, Earth invaded by Martians. Come on, let's kick some Earthling butt. But these aren't your average Martians. Dude. They're below average Martians. Ouch. Way below average. Prepare to die, Earth scum! <laughs> Maybe later. There may be intelligent life in outer space, but this isn't it. They're just stupid. What a disaster. They're Space Invaders. Sunday at 8 on Channel 11, New York's movie station. An apparent stowaway was found dead inside a wheel well of a Colombian jetliner last night shortly after the plane arrived at JFK Airport on a flight from Bogota. The Port Authority says the body was found about an hour after flight number 20 landed, but it could not confirm whether the man inside the wheel well was the same one who reportedly survived two other flights from Colombia, once making it all the way to Miami alive. The actor who played Johnny Ryan on the soap opera Ryan's Hope has died. Bernard Barrow died of lung cancer yesterday in Manhattan. He was 65. Barrow played the patriarch of the Ryan family for 13 years, but his most recent soap opera role was that of Louis Slavinsky on Loving. He won an Emmy for Best Supporting Actor for that part in 1991. Barrow's screen credits include Serpico and Rachel Rachel. He also appeared in several off-Broadway plays and taught theater and drama at Brooklyn College. An era in late night television comes to a close tomorrow night when longtime talk show host Joe Franklin goes off the air after 43 years. Bill Tush has the story of the self proclaimed king of nostalgia. In its infancy, this was television's favorite fair. It made stars of entertainers like Milton Berg. Meanwhile, on radio in New York was a young disc jockey named Joe Franklin, who TV was soon to call. They said, Joe, if we give you an hour a day, how would you occupy that hour? I said, how about if I do a show of people talking, nose to nose, eyeball to eyeball, face to face? They said, Joe, you're out of your mind. The word is television. Got to give them vision. Got to give them seltzer bottles, pratfalls. Got to give them baggy pants. Got to give them burlesque. Kids. Nobody's going to watch talk. But I defied them, and I did what I think was the first authentic, pure talk show. There were two things we were sure of in the silent movie then, that the Indians never got the best of it, and Cecil Hayakawa never got the girl, right? And 43 years later, Franklin is still talking. The idea of a spin-off uh, of you as Rhoda, uh, secretly, maybe in the back of your mind, or... No, not, I'm not a, you know, a phony, I'm not a wise guy. I think I look in people's eyes. The other thing I had going for me after a certain number of years was venerability. When you've been around, as long as I've been around, you become part of people's lives, you become part of a, of a habit. But along the way, he also gave first breaks to some of today's biggest stars. Bette Midler was my receptionist. She used to answer my phones here. In fact, the song that she made famous, or vice versa, that she revived, called the Boogie Woogie Bugle Boy of Company B, is from my sheet music archives inside. Not everyone has come back to thank him. Many who, and justifiably, because they don't want to be reminded of the days when they were beginning. You know, it's, it's human nature. But then again, some have. I mean, I have to come back here and say thank you. Now, after 24,275 shows and 300,000 guests, Joe Franklin will reside in the place he claims he invented, Memory Lane. Bill Tush, New York. When we come back, the New York City Marathon is still three months away, but they're already kicking things off. Pardon the play on words. And we will also show you the newest edition down at Bush Gardens. Look at this. Stay with us. It speeds through space, locks onto its top.